He's unpredictable. He's relentless. He's fearless. He's smart. He's a jerk. Oh, man, what a jerk. How would you describe Kirk Minahan? He's talented. He's blunt. He's complicated. He's the fakest tough guy I know. He's honest. A self-proclaimed weenie. He's angry. He's actually a good guy. He's a psycho big mouth prick. I wish we had more Kirk Minahans. How would you describe Kirk Minahan? Combustible. Unpredictable. Venomous. Chesty. Obnoxious. Selfish. Polarizing. Pompous. Enough about me. Let's get to the show. It's Kirk Minahan's Enough About Me. The two best play-by-play guys in this city in my lifetime is Mike Gorman and former Red Sox broadcaster Sean McDuck. You know, I know this Sean was. I looked you up. No Twitter. There's no Twitter. <laughs> no. There's, there's no account. No Twitter. Uh, well, I, I read it from time to time if there's a topic that I think I would be interested in. But ESPN several years ago said they'd like all the on-air people to do Twitter. And I said, well, can you fire us for something that we tweet? And they said, yes. So I said, well, I think I'll just stay off that then. So. Well, you, so you it's don't really even... to protect myself against myself, I guess. So you only have like a dummy Twitter account just to keep up? I mean, just nope. not even like an anonymous one with one of those eggs or something? But, you nope. Know, really? Zero. So you don't, do nope. you, you don't pay attention to it during the day? See, for me, I'm, I, I'm jealous. It dominates my life. It, it's, you know, when you're doing the show like I'm doing, I'm on it all the time, all day looking for stuff. So you just do it traditionally? Yeah, I really almost don't do it at all. I, I really have very little interest. I mean, sometimes I do it just in the process of information gathering for games that I'm doing, you know, go on there and read about a hot topic involving one of the teams or players or coaches or something. But uh, I really don't have much interest in following anybody or, uh, you know, I think Charles Barkley was the one who had the quote about, you know, it's where people go to feel important. And, you know, it's just, you know, I'm glad people get a kick out of it. I think it is useful in a lot of ways, but it's just something that I don't find that interesting, and I think in terms of doing my job, there are other ways that I can prepare that are more effective than you know just reading sort of what random people think. Are you against social media as a rule? No, I'm not against it. I I know people you know who use it very effectively. I think Jay Billis is right. You know, one of my best friends and obviously a colleague. Um, you know, his, he's turned it into almost a side industry for himself. I think he has over a million followers and. You know he he does it very effectively and he's interested in it, but I'm I'm just not. But I'm I'm not one of those people who think it's necessarily stupid. I think it serves its purpose, but I think there are probably people who spend way more time on it and paying attention to it than they should. What do you, what do you and think? I've worked with people who, during the game, will search for their name to find out what <laughs> people are Is saying about them, and then if one person you know out there uh, tweets something that's negative. Uh, these people get very upset in the middle of the game. But can you believe this guy or this woman just tweeted this about me? It's like, well, uh, I don't know if I can believe it or not, but I certainly don't care. Well, that's the problem. You know, we have on our show is at the station, we have a, a, a text line. And it might be sponsored right now. might not be. I always forget. But we have certain hosts who are like, it's like Bledsoe used to focus on Ben Coates. They get so targeted on this text line that if somebody texts two or three things in a row saying, you know, you're an asshole, you suck, da, da, da. They get so worked up by it, it absolutely affects their performance. My argument would be, just throw it out the window. It doesn't. What does it matter? It, I've never, right. I've never it, understood that. It really doesn't. And, you know, before Twitter existed or these other forms of social media, there were still people out there watching games or listening to your show who either thought we were really stupid and had no idea what we were talking about, a total jerk, or the greatest thing that ever happened to communications in America. And we had no way of knowing back then what any of those people thought, and it really didn't impact us so now that we have ways of finding out I, I really still don't care and i do think it's interesting as you say kirk that a lot of times it's people in our business who make a living out of going on the air every day and saying whatever they want about whomever they want right who get the most offended in, in a snit when somebody says something about them well i know i i know i can't because i blast people even in the media all the time so you can't sit there do what we do and then if somebody has you know the, the the audacity to say, yeah, I don't like the way you talk on the radio. I don't like your opinion on something. Well, okay, great, fantastic. A, you know, one thing you'll see also is, especially on Twitter, I guess you're not on it, but if you're on, if you're on Twitter enough, you'll see the same people criticize you the same time over and over again, day after day, which probably means they're listening. You know, that's, that, that's the other, you know how it is, you know, having been in this business, a lot of people who just hate listen anyways. They just listen because they hate you. Well, that's probably true, although I find that, Strange, but I'm sure. But you know what correct. I mean. It's a very well. Listeners, listeners are strange. They're just a well, bizarre group of people. 
By the way, so are talk shows. It's a good thing that they exist, and it's a good thing that they watch sporting events on TV. True. Or neither one of us would have well, a that's job. A, that's a good point. Yeah, I think the vast majority of people who listen to you probably and watch uh, sporting events on TV are good, smart, decent, well-intended people. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's why I think people who obsess over things like Twitter, you know, I think it's such a small minority of people who who get on there and do it. And, you know, one of the things I learned from my dad, Kirk, a long time ago is if, if you want to get on there and say something about people, and you know, I'd like to think when I'm broadcasting sporting events, I'm not afraid to give my opinion if it's called for. But if you're going to get out there and say things, then you certainly better be willing to take it. And if that includes every now and then taking some slings and arrows in the Twitterverse, then I think that's something we all just better accept. I feel almost dumb doing this, but I guess there are people listening who are younger than me, maybe, and younger than you that, that don't know who your dad was. I, it's almost embarrassing having to tell people. It's Will McDonough, who was the legendary uh, football writer, sports writer at the Boston Globe. For me, you know, growing up around here in Winchester, I mean, you know, I look forward to reading him every day, especially on the weekends, all the time. And I do wonder sometimes what a guy like Will McDonough would be. I'm, I'm sure, obviously, you must think about it, too. What he would be like in 2016, what his role would be. I mean, it's I can't because he's because he's sort of part Adam Schefter, but part something else. You know, is Adam Schefter with opinion, with attitude, with sort of aggressiveness? Does, does right. that description make sense or no? Yeah, I think that's accurate. You know, it's interesting. I don't know how he'd feel about Twitter. I think knowing the way he felt about things that he probably would largely ignore it and not do it. I mean, he, here's a guy who was known as an investigative reporter, and, you know, I don't think he ever had a cell phone. I know he didn't have an answering machine. And I used to say, aren't you afraid somebody's going to call with <laughs> to try to give you a big scoop and you're going to miss it because they can't get a hold of you? Ah, they'll find me eventually. So I'll find them. So uh, he wasn't much into even the most basic technologies of his time, and it is hard for me to believe that he's been gone for more than 13 years now. But it still happens all the time, Kirk. I'll be walking around town or through an airport or something, and somebody will come up to me when there's a big story going on, especially with something like Deflate Gate, and say, geez, I really wish your dad was still alive because I'd love to know what he thinks about it. I know he'd have the inside scoop, and, and it happens time after time after time. People always say to me, I really wish uh, your dad was around because I'd love to know what he thinks about this, that, or the other thing. How do you get along with Belichick? I know we got along great with Parcells. He got along well with Belichick. Uh, Would that have changed, you think, over the last – you know, 10, 15 years, think that would have changed? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure Bill Belichick had ever would, you know, have ever done anything enough to uh, to change my dad's opinion of him. Right. You know, we, uh, way back when, um, I did a radio show very briefly on another station in town. And oh, we'll, get, dad, we'll, we'll get to that, yeah. No, we need to please don't. <laughs> oh, we, we will. Chapter, your dad used <laughs> to be on. just like to erase. Right, your, the, dad, uh, your dad was on. Yeah, my dad you know, would come on with me from time to time. And, right. uh, every Monday, back in that day, we had Patriots Monday. As a matter of fact, the first year that the you know the Patriots emerged out of nowhere with Tom Brady and wound up winning the Super Bowl, um, we'd go down and do a Monday show from Foxborough. And you know, Belichick mm-hmm. was great. He and my dad got along really well. As a matter of fact, my dad had written a book with Parcells the called final, the final Season, right? Season or yeah, like that. right. That's what it was. And then there were all kinds of rumors that Parcells was coming back to coach. So one day Belichick showed up for the show, and he walks into the little conference room in Foxborough where we're doing it, the old stadium, and he put the book on the table. And he said, so can I get my money back for this? Because it wasn't going to be the final <laughs> season. So, you know, they, they got along very well. And I like Bill. You know, I've, I've gotten to know Bill just a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, like a lot of people, you know, with the – his performance arc at the press conferences in uh, Foxborough isn't necessarily what he is all the time when he's away from that setting. You know what I think we missed from your dad, especially over the last year or so, is it seems now when somebody, and I mean, obviously your dad had sources and he had favorites and he had people he liked, but it seems that when you got a story from Deflategate, say, it seemed obvious that it was NFL planted or it seemed obvious that it was Patriots planted. Your dad, and again, you would know much better than me, but I think of the the Parcells leaving the Patriots thing. The first time he was able to talk to Kraft, he was able to talk to Parcells. It seems on this Deflategate thing, he'd probably be able to talk to a Goodell or somebody in the NFL while talking to somebody in the Patriots. You know that there was there wasn't that blend here in the past year. It just seems so one sided. Every single story you read. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think because it was really one of those stories that just depend on who and what you believed or. 
in a lot of cases, who and what you wanted to believe, uh, even sometimes regardless of what the facts were that you were processing. But, you know, that's definitely one of those stories I, I would have been, I would have loved to have heard and read what he do about it because he probably wouldn't have known as much as anybody. I feel confident saying that. You see, you know, you, you said earlier that we weren't able to get feedback from listeners back in the old day like we are now. I'm going to have to disagree because the first time I really got to know Sean McDonough was when he was reading letters on Ask the Manager in like 1984, <laughs> 1985. And You're older than I think you are. Jeez. You, you laugh, but that show was legitimate cult stuff. And I still have friends who watched that show when we were younger. And we'll talk about joke about it once in a while, you know, like, because people would send letters. It, it was it was kind of a funny show. To describe it is hard to describe now. If you're like 25 or 30 years old in 2016, you would be on. The general manager of uh, SBK would be on, right? Right, and they would Dan write, Berkery. Great Dan guy. Berkery. And they would write letters like, you know, uh, how come WKRP in Cincinnati isn't on anymore? And you guys would explain why. And that was pretty much the show for a half hour every week, right? Right. With a lot of campy. Oh, totally. Yeah, right. In Tongue between, in cheek. But, but yeah, I mean, it was, I think it was on 10 o'clock on Sunday night or somewhere around that hour. It was taped, of course. But the, you know, people would write in letters. And back then, as you remember, Kurt, I mean, WSBK was this super station. Oh, we massive. Were on all over the country on cable systems because it was the, you know, we had the Red Sox and the Bruins back then and all the movies and all those shows, like the ones you just referenced. So, Sean, what we were, we were all over Canada, too. So, we'd get mail from all over the what place. Were you 22 or 22 or 23? I mean, you were then, a kid, you were a kid was, right? Well, yeah, it was, uh, it was before I was doing the Red Sox games. I started doing the Red Sox games when I was 25, so I was probably 23 or 24. So you show, uh, So what was the – so you got out of Syracuse and you just got hired SBK, S, SBK to do what? Well, I was at Nesson first. Right. I've been doing minor league baseball in Syracuse for three years while I was in college. college yeah. And then uh, Nesson was literally just starting, and I got hired to do uh, college soccer and college hockey. Remember if I did uh, – the Nesson Hockey East, the first year, couple of years with Dave Shea and uh, Bob Norton. And then, you know, back then, and I think still, I don't know if SBK is, I don't think they're involved in the ownership of Nesson anymore. I don't even know. But, you know, back then, WSBK was a partner with Nesson. So there was some synergy, and Dan Berkery saw me on there and offered me the opportunity to come do some stuff on SBK, including ask the manager in a little talk show called 38 on Sports. And then I did the Bruins uh, posting of their. You know, pre-game, post-game, in-between periods, including all the color and pageantry of many one-on-one. <laughs> of is, uh, course, will and, live forever. And then you so, start. Doing... Yeah, that was basically how it uh, started, and I'll forever be grateful to Dan Berkery because um, you know he gave me a chance through the Red Sox games when I was 25 years old, and uh, that wasn't easy for him to do because he knew he was going to get some grief. You know, he said, "Why do I care about hiring Will McDonough's son? I barely know your dad, and this is the most important thing on our station." And if if you're a failure and it impacts the ratings negatively, then I lose my job. So uh, I'm not willing to take that risk. So I'm going to do it based on the hope that you're going to do a good job. I know it's hard. So, uh, no, Dan's ahead. a great guy. I retired down the Cape and uh, keep in touch with him regularly. And uh, one of the most important people in my life, because if he didn't give me that opportunity, I have no idea what I'd be doing now. There had to be, you know, I think it's sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, you're Will McDonough's kid. That's great. But you're also Will McDonough's kid. And again, like I said, if you don't know, the size of, of who he was in this town, you could have gone somewhere else. You could have gone to, you know, California or Kansas or something and started your career. Did it ever cross your mind just to get away from that shadow and kind of, you know, carve your own thing? Yeah, it did. Although, you know, I just, I love Boston. I, you know, I've lived there my whole life. It's where I wanted to be. You know, I grew up dreaming about doing the Red Sox games one day. So, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me to, to escape that. Plus, I love my dad and the rest of my family. And, you know, wanted to be around them, and, you know, it, it just, uh, it worked out well. But I remember, you know, when Dan was hiring uh, the Red Sox play-by-play person for the 1988 season, it probably took two or three months. I don't think I got the job till February, and he told me that, you know, the thing with my dad was actually a negative to him because he just didn't want to hear that, you know, he hired me because I was Will McDonough's kid. And um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not naive enough to think, my dad wasn't a help, and many times, I'm sure, a very big help. But, you know, I think there were times, too, when uh, it wasn't always a help. I know Larry Lucchino wasn't a huge fan of my dad. Did you, <laughs> and, uh, would you, you know, my, my departure from the Red Sox, I think, might have had something to do with his relationship <laughs> with my dad, uh, in addition to a lot of other things. But, uh, you know, so there, there were positives and negatives, but 
but the, the bottom line is uh, one of the things in my life I'm most grateful for is that, you know, my dad was my dad because uh, he was a great man, great influence on me and my brothers and sisters, and, um, you know, it's an amazing thing to be his son. Your first, am I wrong, your first color guy was Bob Montgomery? Is that right or not? Yeah, on the Red Sox. On the I Red did, Sox, uh, right. I believe eight years with Monty and then nine with Jerry Remy, or it might have been the other way around, nine with Monty and eight with Jerry Remy, but I know, I think it was eight with Monty and nine with Jerry. And you've been gone now. 10 or 11 years, is that right? Yeah, after the the first World Series. What did you oh, I, uh, I know you're on with the that was. I know you're on with the guys. Years. You were on the, with the guys this summer. I think I was on vacation or suspended or something, one of the two. And you <laughs> probably suspended. And you talked a little bit about That's the, sort of like a vacation though, isn't it? I as mean, long as like, as long as it's paid, Sean, it's who cares. Yeah. Um Amen. when uh the whole Orsillo thing happened, what was your take and what's your take now is it changed in the last whatever seven well months? i wasn't all that surprised just because you know i felt the same way that he did when it happened to me it was kind of out of the blue i mean they had already indicated to my agent that i was coming back for the next season i had one option year left and then you know that changed for whatever reason or that i don't know because we did never had any subsequent conversations with them but uh so i wasn't that surprised i mean i, I was a little surprised just because you know, Don had been there a long time, and as we saw from the response, was generally very well liked, and obviously had a great rapport with Jerry. And but, you know, I've kind of felt the same way back then of my situation that I'd been there a long time. You know, certainly, people didn't like me, uh, but I think for the most part, people were satisfied. And you know, when you do this, as you do, that you're never going to have 100 uh, percent popularity approval anyway no, so nor do you want I wasn't to that really. surprised you know I, I really think more than anything else is i look back on it that you know, they just had to come to the decision i think dave o'brien likely would have left and gone someplace else uh, probably for a very good opportunity to do tv somewhere else yep and and they had to come to the decision about all right do, you know do we give him this opportunity and say goodbye to don and i think they came to the judgment that Dave O'Brien was a better broadcaster, and you know uh, that's their opinion. I think they're entitled to it. I would I would tend to agree. Uh, you know, I think Don's a terrific announcer. I mean, I, I think anytime you're making those judgments, it's all a matter of personal taste. You know, you might think somebody's a terrific play-by-play announcer, mm-hmm. and I might think he or she is terrible, or vice versa. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, it is really about personal taste. But uh, I can understand why they would make the judgment, Dave's might be a better broadcaster because, um, you know, Dave's one of the best broadcasters in America. So, um, but I think on the other part of it, though, is if you're them making that decision, them being messed in the Red Sox, okay, you know, maybe we think Dave's better, but this guy's been a very good announcer, very capable, loyal Nesson soldier and Don Orsillo. Everybody seems to like, and he gets along well with Jerry. So, you know, we'd hate to lose Dave, but, you know, maybe we keep him around because it's, it's the right thing to do. So, um, you know, I understand why they did it. I, I think they obviously really botched the way they did it. And um, in the end, who knows? I, I called Don as soon as I heard about it. I said, hey, if there's anybody who can relate to this, it's me. And I know it hurts like hell right now. And it's going to hurt for a long time. And you're going to think about it from a thousand different ways. And why is this happening to me? But I just choose to think that, it, in my case at least, it was, God has a plan for all of us, and it was time for me to go do something else, and I'm glad I did. I said, you won't think this now, but maybe five years from now you look back and say, you know, this was a good thing for me, because, you know, I had the chance to go do a lot of things I never would have done, the British Open, the U.S. Open, a lot of stuff that I really enjoyed doing, and, you know, this is a new life experience from Don, and certainly you got to, you know, it's like attending your own funeral, because uh, as hard as it was for him, I mean, I'm sure he was overwhelmed by the a tremendous reaction that he got, and uh, I'm happy that he got that because a lot of people lose their job and uh, at least don't get to hear people say and write so many wonderful things about him like Don got. When when you uh, look at it now and you're okay, I mean, you know, obviously Orsillo has some answer. There was O'Brien. Do you have an answer now when somebody asks you why we removed the play-by-play guy from the Red Sox, you know, those 10 or 11 years ago? Do you have a two-sentence answer? Do you really know? Uh, I don't. You still don't. You still don't know. No. Um, You know, Larry Lacino suggested to me one day, and he wasn't really involved in it. It was more of a you know, Nesson, Sean McGrail, Tom Warner, I think Henry to a certain extent. 
I think there were several factors over Kirk to be as honest as I can be about. I think one of them was financial. You know, I had right. I didn't think that was the biggest one. I had always uh, worked, almost always for the entire time that I did the games for the over-the-year station. You know, starting at WSBK and mm-hmm. continuing the Fox 25 and uh, the Friday nights on Channel 4. And Gene Jankowski had it for one year, I believe. So... You know, I, I was never paid by Nesson. And then, you know, it, when it came under the Nesson umbrella, I think Sean McGrill just had a hard time paying me what I had been making before. Um, and that's fine, but just go ahead and say that. You know? Right. But, well, but I always thought that the, the line, the, the belief that I had, and obviously financially is a big part of it, is that you weren't afraid to be critical of the Red Sox during the game, and it changed, you know, you, I mean, you could see it now versus then. You know, you guys were a lot more critical back then than the broadcast team was, at least in the last couple right. of years. Well, I think that's the other part of it. You know, I, as I said, I think, uh, you know, I don't think some of the things my dad wrote about this ownership group helped. Um, I don't think John Henry liked me doing the radio show. You know, I just think there it was a kind of a convergence of events. Um, and, and I respect their right to make the decision, do whatever they want to do, and that's what they did. Yeah, uh, again, I think like in the case of Don, they probably could have communicated it better. But at a certain point, you know, what does that really matter? It's not going to change the reality. The reality is you're just not doing it anymore. And it's time to move on to the next thing. And um, you know, I'm I'm fine with it with with hindsight. What is strange though is you know the Red Sox are so PR conscious; they're almost obsessed with it. And then something like this, which is so easy to handle one way or another, you know, we talked about it. You know, on our show, you've just said it there. It wouldn't have been hard for the Red Sox to say in, say, July or August or whatever it was, whenever they had to do it. You know, we think Dave O'Brien's a really good play-by-play guy. We think Don's great, but we think Dave's a little better, and we think we're going to lose Dave, so we had to keep him. It's a shame we're going to miss Don. Don was great, but unfortunately we think it's best for business and best for the Red Sox to make this move. I mean, how simple is that? How simple is that? I think you just said it about as succinctly, as perfectly as you could, and I really do think that's the larger issue more than anything else. I think... Maybe part of their reluctance was they didn't want to portray Dave as a bad guy, and I felt terrible for Dave in this whole thing. And I reached out to him too when it was going on and saying, "Hey, you know, you shouldn't. You have nothing to feel bad about. I mean, you really don't. I mean, you're, you're, you know, it's not your fault. And uh, you know, but I think he felt terrible. I know he felt terrible. So uh, maybe that's why they didn't do it the way you just described. But to me, that would have been the best way because it's the truth. And I think most of the time. If you put the truth out there in a situation like that, um, then people will probably accept it better. What is your thought? And I know this isn't easy for you. I get, I mean, obviously, or maybe you just feel different than most people do in Boston. I mean, ESPN has got hammered over the last calendar year over the handling of the Deflategate and the NFL and their ties with Goodell and the Floyd Mayweather stuff. I mean, it's been around here, and I guess our show has been part of driving it. it has been really tough on ESPN. I know it's not, you know, you work there, so I understand that. Do you recognize the thoughts of the people around in Boston, or do you think that maybe it's just real parochial and, and not uh, based in reality? Um, yeah, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, and I don't think Boston would be any different than if these sorts of things happen in any other city and with the same dynamics of work. You know, I think ESPN is in a tough spot because, you know, obviously we do have a major business relationship with the NFL and with all the other leagues, you know, professional and college that we cover. Uh, but I do know that ESPN really does take itself very seriously and does try to do things in a journalistically appropriate way. I mean, I think a lot of the people who do our investigative stuff are some of the uh, people of the highest integrity that I know in our business. You know, I put Bob Lee at the top of that list, for example. I mean, these are people who are trying to do the right thing, but you know, there's dynamics at work, just like there would be at your station when you guys have the rights to the Red Sox, and I'm sure you want to keep them, and I'm sure management wants you guys to be honest and give your opinion and and uh, be provocative. But at the same time, they don't want you to tick off, off you know, the most important business partner that you have to the extent that maybe that relationship goes away. So I don't think ESPN's situation journalistically is much different than a lot of other news organizations. I'll say, you know, I'll say one thing. You're right. But one thing that surprised me here in my, I guess, is going my fourth year coming up on the show. You know, I've criticized the Red Sox a lot. And we were on Nesson. I criticized the whole Jerry Remy thing a lot. And I was, Sean, stunned. I never heard from 
the management of the EI or at Nesson about it right. either time. Now, of course, Nesson, you know, took us off the air, and my guess is that's probably the reason why. <laughs> well, there's your answer. <laughs> right. But I was, but that, but that, oh, that does surprise me. Very rarely, uh, and maybe, you, you know, you, you can speak to it at ESPN as well. Very, very, very rarely have I ever heard them complain about content stuff. What they'll always say to me is, you know, as long as it's fair, as long as we can defend it, it's okay now. If I go off on the diatribe and say what I said about, say, Aaron Andrews, that's indefensible. I mean, it's just that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm going to get hit for that. But if it's legitimate criticism, generally, uh, by and large, they've been okay with it. I don't think they really like it, but I think they know you kind of have to deal with it. Well, I, I was in the same situation. I, mean, I did the Red Sox games for 17 years. There was never once when anybody came to me and said, hey, you know, you need to be less opinionated or less critical. As a matter of fact, one time John Harrington said he thought it helped that I gave my opinion from time to time. No question. When I defended the team, people knew, hopefully, that I wasn't a houseman and was just staying at the yep. South Bear company line, even if I didn't agree with it. So he felt it gave me some credibility with the viewers that if I did support the team's position in something, that it really was my honest opinion and not what the team wanted me to say. So, uh, But I'm sure that wasn't the case uh I know it wasn't the case a lot of times, and I'd rather have them tell me myself. You know, if I think it's what you just said. If you give your opinion, you give the reasons why you support it with facts or whatever, um, then that's fair. And doesn't mean that you're right, but at least you're supporting your opinion. Uh, I think if you just were out there tossing bombs all the time that weren't based in any reality, that the team would have a right to be upset about it. Sure. And, uh, yes, and I think, you know, I mean – like, we have the Red Sox games on the station, but, you know, for the last two years, if we're going to come on the air and say, hey, everything's fine, there's no problem, there's this, this. I mean, you, you sound like a fool. Now, you, yeah, you do, and then you lose all credibility but some with, people, the, but with some, the listeners, but and some people, that doesn't do anybody any good, including right. the team. But some people can do that. They can live their—I'm always amazed at that. Some people can live their lives and pretend that nothing's wrong while things are—I mean, it, it's a living. I understand it's a way to make a living, but it would—I like, couldn't see you— you know, being a house organ the last couple of years. And not that Orsilla was either. He tried, I mean, but he's got to pick his spots. But I couldn't see the last couple of years go on the air and just act like everything's okay when it's a disaster. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody has to do it their own way. I just maybe because, again, I've grown up around my dad. Right. I just felt like uh, you the foremost responsibility is to the viewer or the listener, and it makes absolutely no sense if a guy drops a fly ball that he should have caught and everybody knows it for you to say, well, that was really a tough play, but everybody watching knows that it wasn't. So, you know, I don't know who that serves, but it doesn't really serve anybody. So, you know, I just, but I think everybody has to do it in the style uh, that comes most naturally to them. And in all honesty, I mean, I feel bad for Don. I'm sure there were probably plenty of times he wanted to give a stronger opinion and realize in part perhaps on what happened to me, that maybe that isn't such a good idea with an eye toward longevity. And then, you know, he was the ultimate, um, you know, loyal guy and a fine broadcaster, and he still was made to walk the plank. So, you know, who knows? (laughs) Who knows what's the right way to go? That's why I think at the end of the day, you're just better off doing it the way you think you should. And uh, at least if it comes to an end, you can walk out of there uh, feeling like, you did it the way you wanted to. I mean, I made a million mistakes when I was doing it, but uh, but I, I don't regret the approach. You know, I, as I said, I, I really do believe our job first and foremost is to cover the game and talk about what's topical with the team, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Are you happy we are now? Are you happy with ESPN? You happy with the college football and the Fair. college I'm basketball? I'm on the verge of signing up for four more years, and uh, you know, they're giving me some great opportunities, and I think there'll be some more good opportunities coming up in the future. And, you know, I, as you know, Kirk, I, I like to I like the variety. People always ask me what's your favorite sport to do, and I really don't have one. I just like the fact that uh, I get a chance to do several of them, and ESPN is the, the place where you can do that, at least for me. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm at the stage in my life I'm not as ambitious as I was before. I, I realize it's impossible now to go do – a lot of big events because they're all spread out all over the place at these various networks. There are more networks when, than when we were kids. And, uh, you know, it, so at a certain point in time, it just becomes about relationships and friendships. And, you know, I've gotten to the point now where the people I work with at ESPN, you know, Chris Spielman and Todd McShay during the football season and the basketball people I work with, the producers and directors and technicians, they've become some of my closest friends. And, you know, at my age, at 53 to kind of throw that history 
out the window to go make a couple extra bucks someplace else. It's just really not something I want to do. Are you going to do the Masters this year? No. No. Uh, ESPN has the Masters, but right. for the most part, we use the, you know, the CBS, CBS team. Uh, well, you did. I think I, I, Mike Rico and right. a couple of people are involved in the in the getting it in and out of the commercials and that sort of thing. But for the most part, it's the CBS town. How many years did you do the Masters? You did the Masters for what? Five? I did it for four years when I was at CBS in the late 90s, 96, 7, 8, and 9. It was it, a blast. It's, it, uh, have you been to the Masters? I've never been. My dad and I are dying to go one year. We want to oh, do it. Oh, you need to go. I know. It's, you know the, it's probably the best organized sporting event that I've ever into and I've had a chance to go as a fan. I had a couple of buddies who invited me to go down just to go for a couple of uh, days a few years ago as a spectator. And you know, when you go up to the uh, the concession stand and you order a chicken sandwich and a coke, <laughs> like a and they tell you it's four dollars. <laughs> right. You're like, what? Excuse me. Is it true? Did you get the the? Was there a was there was there that list? Was there things you said you could you can't say the patrons and the all that stuff? Uh, no, I, I mean they they don't ever hand you a piece of paper. I mean I think you kind of know. Right. As a matter of fact, one time I did call him the uh, gallery or spec. John Feinstein wrote about it in his book actually. Uh, oh, the majors or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, I, he referenced my. Uh, oh, I, I remember that. One. And you said you correct you corrected like fourteen times. I corrected times myself like... <laughs> about a hundred times <laughs> right. just to make. It was Jack. It was Jack Whitaker, right? And uh, but I I admired uh, them greatly. You know, I I think they uh, they everything that they do at the Masters is really with the intent of of making it the best sporting event it can be. And uh, and I think that you know they could easily gouge people left and right on prices down there. People would pay it because they want to be at the Masters, but uh, they don't. And I think they deserve a lot of respect for that in a day and age where. You know, it's hard to walk into any sporting venue in America now and not go broke paying for food or beverages. What is your take, and you work with them in, in both sports, I know, on sideline reporters, it seems largely uh, that they say stuff that we already know about or they have bad interviews with coaches or players that nothing is said. It seems you know a lot of it is a waste of time. I've said that in our meetings. I think a lot of times, especially the coach runoff interviews, it's almost like to prove that we have access rather right. than that we get anything out of it. I do think, though, when you catch that one out of every once in a while moment where the coach really does say something pretty interesting, mm -hmm. uh, it's worth it. You know, I remember I was doing a game and we had a coach who had replaced the quarterback in the first half. The quarterback had thrown four interceptions, I believe, and fumbled. And on the way off, at halftime, our sideline reporter asked, why did you change quarterbacks? And the coach said, were you watching the game? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, every now and then you do get a moment. Said, okay, that's why we do these things. Um, yeah, I think sideline are the good sideline reporters definitely enhance the telecast. I really like the way that we use Todd McShay on our football. Yeah, he's good. You're right. Just, he's good. Yeah, he's terrific and a great guy, by the way, and a great Boston guy. Local guy, yeah. His wife just had a baby, so congratulations to the McShays. And, uh, but, you know, he, he brings a lot of – I thought when he first started working with us a few years ago that it would be largely just he's going to give us the evaluation of this player as an NFL prospect. And you know, he knows a lot more about it than that. I mean, he's very well-versed in just the X's and O's of football. I would love to – watch tape with him from time to time, he and, and uh, Chris Spielman. And, you know, Todd really enhances the football part of it in addition to the other stuff. But, uh, you know, and I think a lot of times, Kirk, sideline reporters are just there in case something happens. You know, a player is badly injured or the power goes out in the stadium and you need somebody to figure out what's going on. You know, I, I think a lot of times they're just there uh, as protection in case something like that happens. How much control over the broadcast do you have now? You've been doing it for a long time. You know, you're pretty high up on, on the ladder. I mean, how much control do you have or input do you have? How much of that broadcast is basically you? Well, it's an interesting question. And it's really one of the reasons to answer one of your previous questions that I want to say at ESPN is, you know, you can work with producers who are almost dictatorial and just going to say, okay, here's what we're going to cover in the open. You're going to talk about this, and he or she's going to talk about that, and then we're going to you know have to kick off and, but, you know, I've been at ESPN so long and worked with the same producers and directors for such a long time that, you know, it's it's a dialogue. I think the good ones, you know, no one's right all the time. And I think the good producers, you know, they come with their ideas, and most of the time their ideas are great. But if, if you can be in a production meeting and say, you know what, I really think uh, we should probably focus on this in the open or this in the game instead of that, 
and here's why, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll listen. And then during the game, you know, we have talk back buttons on our headset. I don't know how much the average viewer knows about mm-hmm. that, but we have a button on our headset that kills our mic over the air, and we can communicate into the truck like an intercom. So you can talk between every play if you wanted to and say, hey, could you get me a shot of the coach? Or I think this would be a good time for that flashback or that graphic. And I think like teams, sports teams, good broadcasts work that way. There's a lot of communication that goes on during the game that people at home have no idea. And, you know, a lot of times they say good ideas into our head or give us some thoughts about something maybe we should be talking about that we might have whiffed on and, uh, the same works in reverse. So it depends on the producer how much input you have, but I, I, I'm in a situation now where I've worked with the same people a lot and you know, they're not afraid to tell me I'm wrong and I'm not afraid to tell them I disagree with them from time to time, and I think that's healthy. You're not at the point, you haven't got to the point yet, where you're bored by it. Tonight you're in Louisville, you're doing the big game against Carolina. Is there a point where you say, geez, I'm, where am I? We're doing this again, another game, another <laughs> game. another. I mean, is there a point where you say, you might want to try something else. Obviously not. I mean, you're about to up for four years, which is great. Yeah. But do you ever I do burn out? I think about it, Kirk. You know, I, I, I do. You know, and sometimes uh, yeah, the, the, it's the, the traveling part of it and the preparation part of it that get tedious. When you're actually there doing the games, you know, I still get the adrenaline rush every time they're telling me we're 30 seconds from going on the air. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're there with a crowd around you and people excited and it's two high-level teams most of the time, regardless of the sport. It, it is fun. It's just the other stuff that, as you're around longer, it gets to be a little bit tedious. But, you know, I love what I do. I feel enormously blessed to do it. And um, But every time it comes to contract renewal time, I do think about that. I just don't know what else I would do. <laughs> I'm, not sure I'd, I'm not sure I'm any good at this, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be too good at just about anything else either. So uh, yeah, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and and you know, I, one of the things i do like about it is it's not nine to five it's not the same thing every day and you know there is a lot of downtime and there is time to go do other things and you know I, as i mentioned to you off here i've been living in arizona in the winter just because after last winter oh. you know I, I just couldn't take it anymore and i you know you can do this job from wherever you want so right. You know, the plan is going to be to be in Boston for six or seven months and be in Arizona in the winter. Both of my brothers are in Arizona. And, uh, yeah, and so that's helped a little bit, too. You know, the, the, you do have the flexibility to go do other things because it's not a nine-to-five job where you're chained in the same place all the time. This isn't an easy one because I know it's 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 sort of apples and oranges, but who is the best color guy you've ever worked with? Maybe not, you know, maybe not the best at actually watching a game, but the best broadcaster who sat in the other seat that you ever worked wow. with and felt most comfortable with. Wow. And, and you got to tell me the worst, too. That's the way it works. <laughs> That's the way it works. Uh, boy, the best is hard just because, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to work with people who I think are kind of at the top. I mean, I think Jay Billis now has come to be uh, regarded as uh, as good as we have in college basketball. You know, uh, my favorites, uh, Bill Raftery, who I did the basketball with, right. um, with Jay Billis for a long time, but I also worked with Raft for many years before Jay joined us for the three-man booth on, on Big Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think Bill is, is a great blend of knowledge and preparation, but he's still fun, and you know, he just keeps it in the right perspective. You know, I loved working with Jerry Remy. Um you know, same thing. Admired the hell out of his work ethic, and he was there really early in the afternoon every single day, and uh, you know, worked really hard to be as good as he could be. And I think he's somebody who improved a lot over the years because he he cared about it and wanted to get better. Um, wow, I'm going to forget people just because uh, you know I'm loving work, working with Chris Spielman right now. That's why I said what I said about wanting to stay at ESPN. I mean, I just like my situation, the people I work with so much. Uh, you know, Tim McCarver took a lot of grief. Well, I did the World Series with him for a couple of years, but you know, Tim at his best, uh, I think he had insights that almost nobody else had. He got criticized maybe for trying too hard to be insightful all the time, but there were times when I definitely looked at him thinking no one else would have come up with that. So um, it's a long way of sort of not answering your question. But, yeah, uh, well, and, the, and, you're, and you're about to say the worst? Is, was that... Uh, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, do I have to? <laughs> sure, come, come on, of course, of course. No one's listening. Uh, no one's listening. Go for it. Uh, no, I know that's not true. <laughs> the, uh, uh, that's, we'll save that for our next chapter. <laughs> All right, that's fair. That's fair. I, I, yeah, got, I just, you know, no, I understand. That's that's, yeah, that's cheap. I wouldn't show. want somebody even. I'm sure there's probably some people I've worked with who feel that I would be the answer to that question. I wouldn't want them to say it, so uh, I'll show them the same respect and. You know, TV yeah. TV is so weird. I mean, it's just, you know, I did some TV before Comcast fired me a couple months ago. But TV TV is just, it's so it's so weird. And it's, it's different than radio because radio you can kind of, you know, you're talking about one thing and then Jerry might say something, then bam, we're off somewhere else for 45 minutes or an hour. TV is so segmented that I can see if you're a former player, right, just for example, and they mm-hmm. put you in that seat next to a guy like he's been doing it forever. It can be. I can imagine for the first year or so, it can be really terrifying. I mean, it's a totally different world. It is, and I've worked with a lot of former players and coaches who were brand new to TV, and it is alarming to them, and I think to me, how little coaching they get before they're thrown in. Right. I mean, it's just basically, okay, we think you're going to be good at this. Go to the park, put the headset on, and talk, and they don't tell them, you know, here's what we expect, or here's kind of how the mechanics of it work, or here's how you prepare for the game, and this is, you know, the routine of going to the game and meeting with the teams, and, you know, they, they really don't do any of it. They just, and these are people who are used to being coached their whole life, uh, in the case of the ex-players who come into broadcasting. So, uh, to me, that is almost staggeringly silly about the well, way so, uh, you our think, business happens, but they really do just throw these people on the air and tell them to go. Well, I'm just going to use him as an example because, he, I mean, he actually is pretty diligent and works hard in studies, and if he did it, he might be okay. But let's just say Peyton Manning retires and decides he wants to be a broadcaster. There will be a bidding war between Fox and ESPN and CBS, and they will pay this man millions of dollars a year, and they will hire him to do this without knowing if he'll be any good. They'll never give him a test. They'll have no idea if he'll be critical of players. They just want the name, so they'll give him, whatever, 4 or $5 million dollars and say, sit there. And you're right. They'll never, you know, with like Ray Lewis. I mean, they'll just say, just sit there, go and talk, and don't coach. And that seems to be an astonishing waste of capital. I guess they just want the name. Well, and I think they're betting on what they know. I mean, we've all seen Peyton on the commercials right, and right, on Saturday right. Night Live. And well, I'm just using him as an example. Very intelligent, right. well-spoken, thoughtful guy. But that still doesn't mean you're going to be good at this. And, and I'll give you a recent example you know, I worked last year on Big Monday on the college basketball with Shane Battier, mm-hmm. and it was the same thing. You know, he was a you know, Duke guy, and as a player in the NBA, was known as a great interview and, you know, very smart and a great guy. And uh, I don't even think ESPN auditioned him, and they, they put him out with me just thinking he'll be good. And, you know, it's, he's not doing it anymore, I think, uh, by his own admission and by the conclusion ESPN reached, he just wasn't good at it and it's like you know it's like playing to me Kirk in that um you know I say to I talk to broadcasting classes I go back to Syracuse a couple times a year and you know I'll tell them I know you all want to do this and you all want to be Mike Tirico or Bob Costas or whomever but the you know 90 something percent of what Mike Tirico needs or Bob Costas needs to be Mike or Bob is stuff they were born with you know just like athletes you know it's the it's a, I'm not sure broadcasting is a genetic thing, but there are just natural instincts and feel for it that either, and skill sets, uh, but that you either have or you don't. And, you know, some people, even though you might think, wow, this guy's going to be good, they're just not. And for whatever reason that is. And, uh, you know, I would bet on Peyton, for example. I think he'd be great, but he wouldn't be the first guy who everybody thought was going to be great who turned out not to be. We got to talk about the McDonough group for a little bit. We have to. <laughs> We, we do. As we take a moment to... Did I mention I have to go now? <laughs> as, as, we, as we look back... I, let me just say this in your defense before we talk about it, because I was living around here at the time, and I, I'm, I'm great friends with Ordway, but I was at the point in my life where I was ready for an alternative at that point. Right. You know, I said, okay, what do we got here? Here comes Sean McDonough, who I really like, and he's going to do this and this. You talked about raising the bar or, or whatever that was. And, you know, it was on 1510, and so I said, okay, here we go. Can you at least walk me through the process of getting the show on the air before we talk about what yeah. the show was on the um, air. I was like you, you know, WEI back in those days was obviously uh, a major powerhouse. I know you guys are still doing well. Um, you know, I sort of look at you, you guys the way ESPN 
uh, you know, the perception now, oh, ESPN is really struggling. No, ESPN is still making an unbelievable amount of money. They're just not quite the dominant power. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. We're, do, we're doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. uh, but uh, I got a phone call that there was this new station. Uh, I thought it wasn't a new station. I think they existed at some other format. But mm-hmm. anyway, they wanted to compete. Uh, Paul Allen was the money behind it. Obviously, one of the wealthiest people in the world. And was determined to make it go, and we have interest in you being our afternoon drive host. And I said, you know what, I just don't know that that's realistic. At the time, I was doing Red Sox and working for ESPN, and I didn't really have much interest in doing it. And to be honest, Kirk, it's the only thing that I've ever done where the money was the deciding factor. I mean, when I broadcast the Red Sox games or worked for ESPN, you know, it's nice that they pay us and and – uh, but I would do it anyway. <laughs> you know? I mean, sure. I just, it's what I want to do. This I didn't want to do, especially on top of, I mean, most guys who do it and do it well, like you and John and Jerry in the morning, um, you know, the it's pretty much the only thing that you do. Right. And you, so you have the time to prepare for it. And you know, I would do a Monday night game at Notre Dame and get off the air at uh, 9.30 at night and have a 5.30 a.m. flight from South Bend to Chicago to Boston and then go up to Burlington and, you know, try yeah, you to can't, you, you can't do four it. hours. Yeah, you can't do that. No. no. And it's, I wasn't good. At, I mean, I, I, it's, I was disappointed in myself because, you know, if I had it to do over again, I know people at your station criticized me. You know, Jerry Callahan, who is a friend, said, you know, if Sean was really Sean, it would, he'd be good at it. But Sean, he just Jerry just said that to me during a break two hours ago. He said, if you can ask McDonough anything, ask him if he, you know, if he could do it over, would he do it again? Because he well, thinks, I wouldn't have done it. You know, right. as I said, I mean, I just wouldn't have done it, period. You know, I don't think it helped me uh, in terms of, you know, my uh, reputation within the city. I don't, you know, I, I do think it damaged my reputation with the Red Sox a lot. Um, you know, I don't think you know, I just – wasn't proud of my own performance doing. I was tired a lot of the time, and uh, just uh, because you were too you critical, because you were too critical of the Red Sox, or because yeah, the- I mean, as much as people thought I wasn't critical enough on the show, right. I don't think the Red Sox like. I mean, John Henry showed up. You know, I know uh, John Henry showed up one day in the studio just to respond to stuff we've been talking about. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it it helped really on any front other than. Uh, it was a decent paycheck for a year and a half. Um, was but, it was it impossible to compete with EEI at that point, or was it just? Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, you know, I mean, it's it's the, hard. The signal, but Bob Lobel said to me one time, fifteen ten is a great signal if you're a fish. It, it points <laughs> to the east, like the only time you could get it is if you were out in the harbor on a boat. Right. But uh, you know, I, it was very depressing. I'd get in the the car at, at night and you know go home and turn the station on, and you could you could barely get it in the parking lot. Right. And, you know, so, and I, I think history has proven me to be correct that if WEI had legitimate competition, they would have competition. But, you know, it's like anything. No you question. Know, you, not everybody likes the same thing, you know, and uh, I think competition is largely good. So once they had legitimate competition on a, you know, station with a great signal that, you know, had a great brand and a lot of money behind it, we, we all know what happens. There's legitimate competition. So... That's what we were trying to do. You know, I was told they were going to power up the signal and put a lot of money into other parts of the station. And yeah, they, the always, they, is, always, you know, they always bullshit you on that yeah, stuff. Yeah, they didn't do any of that. So, And that's really when I lost interest, You know, when it was obvious to me that they weren't going to you know, try to power up the signal or do the other things that they need to do to really be competitive. You know, I almost felt guilty about just doing it for the paycheck. And, uh, and it you know, really kind of screwed up the quality of my life, to be quite honest about it. <laughs> just... Not fun. It was. It, is it something though? Like let's just say, like you said, like I do it, or John, or Jerry, or <clears throat> Glenn, or any of these guys. If it was just your job, if you went into the ten to two show every day, I'm looking over my shoulder right now. I could see Glenn and Lou and Forey in the studio. Right. Do you think you could do no, that I job? I think I would, would enjoy you like it. That I'm job? not sure yeah. I would enjoy it every day. I mean, I'm not. You know, the uh, well, when I was doing it, it was when uh, you know Drew Bledsoe got hurt and Brady right. emerged and. After about the second consecutive month of every day, all right, do you think it should be Brady or Bledsoe? You know, I, I, I'd had enough. You know, long since had enough. Well, we're, on our, we're on our 13th month of PSI totals and ideal yeah, gas. Yeah, exactly. So it, it can... I just don't have the patience or interest level for stuff like that. So, I mean, uh, I enjoy stuff like this. I'm enjoying the conversation with you. I'm not shy about giving my opinion. It was a little tough, as I said, the 
dynamics of it because I was doing the Red Sox games at the time. Yeah, that's crazy. And that is crazy. That, yeah. <laughs> that's insane. So, I mean, it, as I said, my, my biggest regret is that I knew in my heart and mind I didn't want to do it. And I woke up every day, you know, jump, as you said, I'm in Louisville about to do a basketball game tonight. And, you know, I was excited about watching two of the best teams in the country. There was nothing about that experience that I look forward to. I was fl- sort of waking up every day, I go, oh, crap, we right. have to go do that again today. I'll flip, I'll flip around in the afternoon once in a while, and I'll see Michael Kay at, at, at the ballpark doing this radio show, and I'm thinking, is this guy insane? Is he, I mean, is he, you know, he does the games on TV and the radio broadcast, right? Yes. I mean, well, uh, he does, I, don't think he, I don't think he does the radio anymore. I think the Yankees got, he, separated the radio from the TV, but he does the, no, no, uh, but I'm sorry, but, all but, the Yankee TV games. But, oh, you mean his radio show? Yeah, he has a radio show yeah. and, and ESPN. Oh, and, yeah, he does his radio show and, and then does the Yankee game that night. I'll and, see him uh, huddled in some in some basement somewhere in Detroit to get ready to do yeah. it. And I'm thinking, and this it's tiring. Like, I mean, oh. you know, I mean, people think, ah, you get on the radio and you talk for four hours, or you get on TV and you announce no, I mean, it's football not, game. Yeah, it's yeah. not coal mining, but it wears you out. I mean, in yeah, the travel well, you, especially, and Especially, I mean, I finally went to a football game, you know, on the way home. You know, you're, you're, you're more tired than you realize because you you do have to concentrate on every single word you say for four hours. <laughs> right, right. There's, you can't veg out even for ten seconds, and or else you know, something bad is probably going to happen. So... You know, there's just, uh, again, I'm not trying to juice that. It's not coal mining, but it's, uh, you know, after you do a four-hour radio show, you're tired. Yeah. And you're at least, you know, mentally so. Sure. And to turn around and then say, now i got to go announce a four-hour baseball game, I, I can't imagine doing that or wanting to. Am I wrong in saying that uh, that your show introduced us to Bill Simmons for the first time? Yeah, Bill at the time, you know, he had, uh, I had never heard of him, and then I had a buddy of mine, John Jakes, who said, you know, I've been reading this guy online, blah, 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 the sports guy, or the Boston sports guy, whatever he called himself at the time. And right. uh, so when we started, I don't know how we connected. I don't know if it was somebody at the station suggested we should give him a try, or, you know, I was aware of him from his uh, his blog or whatever you yeah. call it. But the, um, yeah, so, you know, we had a, it was the McDonough group, so we had kind of a rotating uh, stable of uh, co-hosts, and you know, we gave him a try, and uh, I I enjoyed getting to know him. You know, I think he's a uh, you know interesting guy. Obviously, very talented, and uh, some unique opinions. And I, I thought he was a plus. You know, when they told me he was going to be one of the co-hosts today, I thought, okay, you know, that's a good thing. Where sometimes you were like, not really sure about this co-host anymore. So right. Um, well, that's the other thing. With the, that's the other thing with a show like that is it's so like guest reliant the guys you have on and if a couple of them aren't into it or check out i mean you know sometimes you see these guys who fill in for us if it's a four-hour show after like you know two hours their their eyes are rolling in the back of their head and you're like you gotta wake up you gotta fake it for two hours you have to yeah and that was again one of the hard parts for me because there were times when i just was really really tired right, and you're it. yeah looking at your watch like holy crap we have two more hours to go where's the coffee you know it's just uh so i mean if i'm feeling like I'm boring myself. I can only imagine how the listener out there in radio land was enjoying it. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a job. It really is. I oh, mean, it's, we're, we're living it, in the right. toy store of life, and uh, but it, it does require some focus and concentration, that's for sure. All right, Chumble, I appreciate it, and we'll uh, and I'm looking forward. So we'll do one. We'll get you in about six months, and that's when you that's when you'll tell us the worst co-host. You'll tell us all yeah, I'll all do the that. all the Red Sox behind the scenes dirt. You're gonna get into all that with us in the uh, second appearance. I really do appreciate it, Sean. Thanks. Hey, my pleasure. Anytime. Thanks for listening. You want to hear more of the podcast? More of enough about me with all the great guests we've had so far? You go to weei.com or the weei live app, Stitcher, or iTunes.